Hello everyone, my name is Sitlali, Sitlalmina Anawak, and I'm gonna give you a brief book talk about my second self-published book entitled, Don't Call Me Latina, Notes from a Decolonizing Mexicana, Reclaiming Everything That Is Ours. I officially launched this book on Friday, April 15, 2022, which is also my birthday. So I wanted to celebrate that along with the book publication. You can order the book through my Google form. I'm not selling it anywhere else. It is also available as an ebook. So if you are interested, if you're an educator, if you are someone that is interested or curious about this discussion on identity, feel free to purchase my book. I will have the links for you to buy them underneath the video description. I'm going to read a little bit about what the book is about. It says, I was born to heal with poetry and historical artistry. I'm here to reclaim it all for every ancestor who died wishing and dreaming of this possibility. And I'm going to share my screen. Don't Call Me Latina, Notes from a Decolonizing Mexicana, Reclaiming Everything That Is Ours, Book Talk, today, May 17, 2022. Why did I write this book? After 24 years of being an activist, of protecting, defending, and honoring our identities, right, as detribalized, as the indigenized Mexican peoples, I was tired of constantly seeing Latinidad, you know, mutating itself to Latinx, Latine, all these terms, but the actual term is still here, right? So after confronting this term, after being out there in my community for 24 years, I wanted to create a thorough and artistic counter narrative to Latinidad, right? I wanted to put it all in one place as a historian, as a poet, I wanted to merge my poetry, my historical research, my points of views, right? And also offer resources and answers to many of the pressing uh, questions of, okay, so if you're not Latina, what are you? If you're not Hispanic, then what are you, right? So it's merging all of those things together. I also wanted to contribute to the ongoing conversation on identity, right? Putting it into a book uh, for people who don't have social media, for people who are in academia, it makes things much more permanent and much more accessible in that way. So I wanted to put it all together and I wanted to push back against the continuous homogenization of people of color, right? This whole idea that we're all the same and that we're all Latino and this forging of this unity it's a capitalistic, you know, um, scheme that was created in the 60s and 70s, but it's been presented as this cultural unity, as a point of, of strength, right? But it's really presenting us, forcing a market that was not there based on colonial aspects and colonization. I also wanted to assert our right to celebrate, reclaim, and reclaim visibility and representation. Right. So I wanted to celebrate not just our community, but the book is very personal. I have pictures of my family members, of my grandparents. And I also want to lastly express a decolonial perspective. Right. A lot of people I keep having these conversations, but I'm really trying to give you a perspective of someone that's trying to decenter Eurocentricity. So I am going to read you. I think the poem that reflects what this book is about, and it's called One for All. The poem is called One for All, and it's part of my, my book, Don't Call Me Latina. By grouping all people who speak Spanish into one category, corporations can target one audience at the same time and therefore maximize exposure and profit. They don't care about proper representation and cultural identity. It's a colonial power tool to keep us ignorant. Here comes, it's my poem slash rap song. We are not Hispanic or Latino. Those terms do not define my people. Speaking the language doesn't make you the ethnicity. Grouping us together, it's a marketing scheme. They wanna kill us with white supremacy. We are not Hispanic 
we are not Latino. We refuse to identify with colonial terms, defining Europeans by killing the indigenous. The time has not come to put an end to all this. Colonizers hold the power of definition. They want us to exist with no recognition to own to our own ownership of our land in its total restitution. By taking away our names, we are bound to mental chains, ignorant of our ancient history till we end up in our graves. We are not Hispanic or Latino. Those terms do not define our people. Speaking the language doesn't make you the ethnicity. Grouping us together, it's a marketing scheme. They want to kill us with white supremacy. Since 1492, our lands and our identity have been victim of the hands of white supremacy, stripping us of our true connection to our history. It's time that we end the colonial legacy. We are not Hispanic. We are not Latino. We refuse to identify with colonial terms. We are indigenous people who are killed ethnically, mislabeled, and branded as a herd of sheep. We're kept ignorant and culturally asleep, being raped and terrorized for five centuries, kept ignorant of what really happened, and the genocide of our people is quickly forgotten. We are not Hispanic or Latino. Those terms do not define my people. Speaking the language doesn't make you the ethnicity. Grouping us together, it's a marketing scheme. They want to kill us with white supremacy. We were forbidden to speak our languages. We are blind to see the colonial damages, branding us like slaves, slaving us in fatal caves, plucking our original names. And now we falsely claim the Spanish royal lineage. Spain is not our motherland. It's another lie created to keep us in a state of self-hate. We must liberate our minds and begin to understand that we must resist the colonial traps that they create. They continue to benefit and we don't have a clue. Don't let Univision and TV Azteca fool you. Europeans speaking Spanish don't speak for you and me. Simply speaking Spanish doesn't make you the ethnicity. Grouping us together, it's a marketing scheme, a way to buy their products by making us believe that we are the identical, that we have the same needs, maximizing profits, targeting one audience. What a great marketing monopoly. They save money and we lose our identity. We are not Hispanic or Latino. Those terms do not define my people. Speaking the language doesn't make you the ethnicity. Grouping us together, it's a marketing scheme. They want to kill us with white supremacy. We are not from Europe, not Italians, Romans, French, Portuguese. We're not children of Columbus or Cortes. No, you see, speaking English doesn't make like people British. Speaking Spanish doesn't make a Chinese person Hispanic. There's no logic when you really stop to think about it. Apply the same reasoning to other communities and soon you will see the colonial representation. It's false colonial fraudulent unity. Spanish-speaking Europeans still dominate our governments, our education systems, and our resources. There has never been true independence, just European civil wars on our continent, whether they speak Spanish or English. European settlers are still in power. We are not Hispanic or Latino. Those terms do not define my people. They say that we're a melting pot, but no, we're actually being cooked alive. They say that we are a melting pot, but no, we are being cooked alive. And that is one of the poems I'm gonna share. And I'm actually gonna share the my favorite poem out of this whole book. And just so that you know, it's book is written in three chapters. Chapter one, it's poetry. Chapter two, it's photography. Chapter three, it's reflections, right? So I'm gonna read you for all brown girls. And that's me as a little girl. So this poem is called For All Brown Girls. Before I knew anything about my history and my healing need for decolonization, I was described as a little brown girl from LA. Before I was aware of my ancient connections, I was a little brown girl from LA, chilling with my fam in South LA, going to South Central, going to birthdays in Compton, smashing piñatas and Watts, brown skinned children, creating magical moments on concrete, little brown girls running down the curve of the LA river, little brown girls, magical old souls, no mentors. Our imagination was our salvation. It made us immune to the normalized violence, made us run faster at dark. Little brown girls, little brown girls, this is for you. And you can read more poetry from my book, Don't Call Me Latina. So 
how did I write this book? And by the way, these are, this is a picture of my maternal grandparents, my grandfather, Jose, and he was a mariachi since he was like four years old till he passed. And this is Cornelio Reina. For those of you who don't know, he's a, he was a very famous Mexican regional um, artist, Mexican singer, amazing, came out on movies. And that is my grandmother, uh, Mercedes, who is, they're both embracing him. And this took place in Rosarito, Baja California, which is where the majority of my family from my mother's side still live to today. So the book is written in three chapters, right? So chapter one, it's poetry, which I just shared some. Chapter two, it's photography. Chapter three, it's history, notes, and reflections. And I added more to it, right? Because I figured the first book I wrote, it's called Obsidian Blades. I wrote that book um, in 2013, 2014. And so many things have happened. This was my first poetry book that I, that I self-published, Obsidian Blades. So there's so much that has happened since I published this book. So I wanted to update everybody. I wanted to let you know where I'm coming from, what are the new revelations that I've gone through. And so I added some reflections at the end of the book. I added, what do I identify as, right? Because I get that a lot. If you're not Latina, if you're not Hispanic, then what are you? So I have an essay that I wrote called, what do I identify? or how do I identify, right? So that's towards the end of chapter three. And I wanted to answer that question, right? And give my testimony as a detribalized, de-indigenized Mexicana, what that looks like. And because 2020 was such a powerful year and it was a year that I became pregnant and I was not allowed to participate in actions, um, that's what birthed my online um, courses that I started teaching on YouTube live for free. And then later on, when I, I had to quit my job, I decided to launch an autonomous online course where I can sustain my family that way. So that's what I've been doing now. But I wanted to talk about the reflections that I saw about the ongoing machismo in our communities, especially when it comes to activism. So I have an essay about that, about misogyny and activism, machismo and activism. And I also have something to say for when the uprisings were happening of Black Lives Matter, you know, a lot of our people from our community were joining the actions, right? From social justice, they were joining the groups. And it was really sad to see how a lot of people in our community responded to that by saying, oh, wow, like, why are you joining a Black movement? Like, they don't care about us. And what about brown lives? Brown lives matter, too. So I kept hearing that constantly, had all these arguments online with people. Like, it was just so toxic and so fucked up the way that that was that conversation was happening, right? So instead of us being happy that our people are are becoming active, right, that they're caring about something, that they've been impacted by this, it was taken as a, what are they doing about us, right? And that comes from a very ignorant standpoint because had you been involved, right, prior to 2020, you would know that there has always been a black and brown unity um, element in activism. So just because people didn't know about it doesn't mean it didn't exist and shouldn't be, and that are people that are joining Black Lives Matter or fighting justice, that's not taking away from our struggles. Right, as someone that has participated in um, Black actions throughout the years, right? So I talk about that, my critique on the whole expression, Brown Lives Matter, right? So you can read that. And I also offer you a list of resources. I give you a list of books that I highly recommend. I give you a reference if, you're, if you or your family come from a Nahuatl speaking um, history and heritage, from the Huasteca Nahuatl, I have a relative with Lawak from speaknahuatl.com who does amazing work. They do classes online. They have beginning courses, advanced courses. They have consultation services. So in case you want to translate something in the Nahuatl Huasteca variant, because there's different variants of Nahuatl, um, that is a great resource for the community. So that's how this book came together.
Now, who do I have in mind? By the way, that is a picture of me at my favorite place, Plaza Mexico in Linwood, California. I tend to go there a lot with my protest signs and have amazing, powerful conversations with my community. I call it street poetry. Um, I call it comadreando and we have a blast. So anyway, so who do I have in mind when I wrote this book? I'm thinking about the Mexican community in the US, right? I'm very specific. Like, I think a lot of people can relate to it, but my specific experience comes from the Mexican experience, right? So that's what I am presenting. And specifically, I have in mind those that, like myself, have been detribalized, right? I am the fourth generation removed from a Nahuatl speaking um, family and community from Huchitlan, Jalisco. From my mother's side, I don't know much about my father's side, right? So that is where I'm at. And I've been doing this work for 26 years this year, right? So I'm also keeping in mind those who identify as Chicanx, right? Chicana, Chicano community, um, especially our elders in the Chicano movement. I'm really curious to see their, their reflection on this. And anyone open to learning a decolonial perspective on identity formation, right? I think the conversation of identity, it's continuous. Um, a lot of people have opinions about it and there's a lot of resistance, right, about this. But I think it's important if we're going to have a thorough conversation about racial formations and identity in this occupied um, colony, then it's important that we have a, a specific conversation about colonial identities and how damaging they are for our community. I definitely have in mind educators, right? Um, people in especially uh, historians, right? If you're English, English majors, <laughs> uh, English teachers, historians, high school. I, because I started learning this history at the age of 15, I am really sensitive to the demographic of our youth, right? Because that's a powerful age to be in when you're 12, 13, 14. That's when a lot of things start clicking in your mind. You start being critical about a lot of things that are presented to you, information. So I'm always thinking about them and I constantly am so grateful that I'm invited to speak to our youth in different, in different venues, um, schools. I've also spoke at graduation ceremonies, South Central, Los Angeles, just really honored when I can share space in that way. So that's who I had in mind when I wrote this book. And lastly, where is this book at? How can you obtain it yourself? Well, let me show you. This is an image taken at my book launch celebration that just happened April 16, about a month ago um, in Bell, California. And what I want you to do, and I'm hopefully you walk away with, is to reclaim our stories, reclaiming our voices. I'm so tired of other people from outside of the community telling our experience or reading all these white people talk about Mexicans and the Chicano experience, the Chicanx experience. It's really sad, right? And there's so much talent in our community. There's so much for us to say and to share. And we need to be represented, right? We need to be represented, you know, rightfully. We need to be represented with respect, not like caricatures, not like stereotypes, like it just happened on Saturday Night Live. Not like that, but really take up space in how we should be remembered and respected. You can order my book through tinyurl.com forward slash not Latina. I have it available as a hard, as a hardback, no, I wish, as a paperback and as an ebook. So you can get a cop access up to it immediately. If you buy the, e the ebook, I will send it to you within 24 hours. If you buy the paperback, I will send it to you as soon as the post office is open and I can get myself up there. So that's how you can buy this book. And a little bit more about what I'm doing. You know, I want, hopefully this book serves as an example for you. Hopefully it serves as, as inspiration, right? One of the things that I'm constantly thinking about, right? When I create my courses, when I write a book, it's that we have to create what we wish existed. Yes, I could complain. Yes, I could do this and that. But there's something very powerful when you create, right? Because you, you know what's missing, you know what's lacking. So coming to that understanding and that awareness and actually creating it yourself, right? That's what I challenge you all, to create what you wish existed. I want you to write the books that you would want to read. You know, what did you need to read growing up? I needed a book like this. 
I needed a book that was relatable, accessible, that was explaining things to me in an easy way, that was making me feel celebrated and loved and embraced. I needed that as, as I was growing up. I didn't find that. I didn't see that, right? And the ones that I that were out there were not really decolonial. We're not really, you know, centralizing our experiences and being very political and vocal against white supremacy. And I want us to tell the stories that deserve to be known, right? There's so many beautiful stories, so many, you know, elders have many stories. We have a lot of stories of our resilience, of our beauty, of our resistance, and so much about us doing everything that we can do with what we have or where we're at. And also express your voice. You deserve to be heard, right? And publishing my own book, I do have like that little voice, like, yes, that que se cree, publishing her own book. It's like, I'm publishing my book because I want people to know this perspective. I want people to know why it's wrong that this term Latino is in existence and how it exploits our community and how it adds to the erasure of native communities. Not all of us speak Spanish. There's a lot of us in our communities that are still speaking in indigenous language and can barely speak Spanish, right? Like these colonial factors, like the whole process of us learning the Spanish language was through genocide, was through violence, was through terrorism. So now to be associated with the product, right, of, of colonization, it's an injustice and it's, it's a way to disconnect us even more from our identity, our heritage, and our lands and connect us and associate us with Europe. Right, because look at the numbers. Look at the massive numbers of indigenous Mexicans up in here, and indigenous Central Americans, indigenous South Americans out in here. There's a lot of us, right? So it's easier to just push us aside and otherize us, right, with Latinidad, with Hispanidad, and then think about how ridiculous it is. It's basically saying all of you south of the border, you're all Latino. You're all the same shit to me. You come from past the borders or whatever. So there's just so much dripping and ignorance with those terms of Hispanic and Latino. Let me invite you to the work that I do, to the ideas, the content that I create. I am present on YouTube. I am on TikTok. I am on Instagram and Facebook. You can find me under Mexican Excellence. Or you can also participate in my courses. I offer free classes on YouTube. I have the courses there. I also offer private courses for the BPOC community. BPOC stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. That is the experience and space that I am creating. It's a safe space for my community to come together, decolonize, learn this history together, share our stories. Because to me and the understanding that I have is that history is medicine, is that us understanding our history through a non-Eurocentric lens really offers us a lot of healing, really offers us a lot of explanations that makes us feel understood and makes us feel better about our situation because we understand this process, right? Learning history makes us understand why we are where we are and how and what we need to do, right? To, uh, to better our communities, to liberate ourselves from these colonial legacies, from this Eurocentricity, from this Eurocentric narratives. So I try to create exciting, educational, fun content to make this historical information and research that I'm coming across to make it accessible to everybody, right? So TikTok, I'm fairly new on TikTok. I'm really excited to be there. Thanks to my little sisters who told me to get on there. You know, I'm just trying to bring this information. I'm trying to present it in a way that I needed it, right? When I was younger, um, something that's exciting, that is uh, critical, but at the same time offers us, you know, transparent research, offers us resources, offers us, you know, books to read, like how do we engage with this information without becoming elitist, right? And because I survived a very toxic elitist um, organization, I am very sensitive to that. I'm very sensitive to making sure that I bring to my community transparent research and scholarship. I share what I know and I'll tell you what I don't know, right? Because I am not all knowing. There's just so much information for us to learn, but this is what I have come across thus far. And this is where you can learn it from yourself. 
And this is also an invitation. I'm really excited for Decolonial Summer School. I'm actually an autonomous professor. I teach decolonial history courses outside of academia. I am not associated with any institution. I create these courses for people of all ages from the BPOC community, and they are mainly um, through Teachable. You would watch the pre recorded lectures, and then we meet through Zoom, right? So, a little breakdown my next class starts June 1st, and it's going to be a hybrid seven week long class, right? I used to teach this in four and five weeks, believe it or not. But because of the feedback that I have received from my students, I was like, okay, no, like they've all asked me to make it longer and to give more space in between our meetups because when we have a discussion, there's a lot of things. And just so that you know, I do not record our discussions. I want to honor that safe space that I am in with my students because in learning our history, so many things get unpacked, so many things come out, right? And I want us to be responsible with that, with vulnerability. I want us to be responsible with those stories and uh, build community that way, right? So what do you expect from my decolonial history of the Americas? Uh, it's no homework. Um, I will ask that you participate in the discussion to kind of bring your summary or reflection on the material. And you have access to recording 24 seven through Teachable. You create your account and you can watch the lecture as many times as you want. Um, you will have access until the end of the year, right? Until the end of the year. So really, really important. It's four lectures with multimedia resources. You get, basically, I give you free downloadable books, um, additional readings if you want to get more into depth with what we're talking about. And we have four, it's actually five recorded uh, lectures that you have access to. And then we're going to meet three times during the seven weeks. And again, this is a learning space dedicated to the BPOC community. The, on the right side, you'll see the syllabus. We are going to meet for orientation online through Zoom for an hour and a half. Then the next two weeks, you will receive a lecture recordings and then we'll meet again the fourth week. We'll have a discussion on what we talked about. And I'm gonna ask students to teach back, right? So for you to become the professor and teach us what you learn in those recordings and we can have a very fruitful conversation that way. Then you get two more lectures the next two weeks and our final class meeting is going to be class number seven. Uh, we have a class meeting discussion and celebration. I do want to let you know that because I started this course last year, I, be, I launched e Decolonize as a online learning community in fall of 2021. And I have students out there who have taken these classes if you are a previous e-decolonized student, you will get a hundred, you will get 50% off on this course. And the rest of you, there is a payment plan. There's three different payment plans if you're interested. And I have a half off discount for all prior e-decolonized students. And with that, I want to say Tlaskamati, thank you for listening. Thank you for stopping by, checking out this book. Feel free to message me your questions or comments. You can go to my website, titlali-anawak.com. On my website, you will see everything there. I have all my classes that are available. I have my free courses there. I have my book publications. I'm the one that's selling my book, which this is about, right? Don't call me Latina. You can go to tinyurl.com forward slash not Latina and order your book. So please message me, subscribe to my website as well so that you can be updated with all the things that I've been doing. I do have other courses that I teach. I'm going to be teaching uh, women of Mesoamerica in the fall. And I'm also going to be teaching decolonial history of Mexico also in the fall. So stay tuned. Make sure to follow me on social media, whatever platform you can. Make sure to subscribe to my website so that we can stay in community and in conversation. Until next time, this is Itlali from Mexican Excellence. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Inviting you to check out my book, Don't Call Me Latina, Notes from a Decolonizing Mexicana, Reclaiming Everything That Is Ours. Thank you so much. See you next time.